Hello, everyone. Test, test. Okay, great. So now it is 6.30 and we will start our Cosmic Thursdays lecture. So first, um, I'd like to thank you everyone for joining us tonight at Cosmic Thursdays. My name is Xinan Du and I am in charge of education and public outreach in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Riverside. I am also the organizer of this event. So while we have already been running this public lecture series for almost five years, this is actually the first time we're doing it online. So um, obviously we have a lot to learn. Um, we are obviously adapting to the current situation and are also trying our best to continue our service to the local community. So we're very grateful that you're here to join us today at this pilot virtual lecture. Um, I'd certainly love to collect your feedback later on how we did uh, on the event, well, either good or bad. Um, so we could improve next time and uh, keep bringing astronomy and science in general for everyone. So our speaker today is Dr. Robert Zellum, who's been a long-standing astronomy enthusiast. He received his PhD in planetary sciences from the University of Arizona after which he joined the NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He is extremely passionate for and active in outreach and has also been leading citizen science projects. So today he will be talking about how we can find and gain knowledge of those planets that are orbiting very distant stars. And finally, I'd like to thank our lovely volunteers today. Um, so once I call your name, wave at everybody. Um, they are Jessica Topo, Franco Iglesias, and Nako Gungoli. So they will be moderating the live chat, which you can see on the right hand side. We welcome all kinds of questions and also encourage you to engage in discussions. The volunteers will also answer questions and relate your questions to the speaker as we go along. So without further ado, take it, out, take it away, Rob. Okay, can everyone see my screen and see a full-size version of the PowerPoint? Yes? Okay, great. So everyone, thank you so much for having me. Hopefully everyone is doing okay and staying safe. My name is Dr. Rob Zellum and I'm here to talk about exoplanets, about finding life in the galaxy. So I'm what's called a, a, an astronaut basically, right? So here's a photo of me. Actually, no, no, that's, that's not me. This down over here is me. So I actually get this question a lot. Did I ever want to be an astronaut as a kid? And the answer is a hard no, because I'm definitely afraid of heights. So rather than going up into space, I'm very happy to stay down on earth and be working on my computer. So that is why instead of an, ast an, uh, an astronaut, I'm an exoplanet astronomer. So let's break down this terminology and see what it means. So exoplanet, what does that mean? Well, that's short for extrasolar planet, where extrasolar means beyond the solar system. So any object outside of our solar system. And planet means planet, right? So when we mash them together, an exoplanet is any planet that is outside of our own solar system. And I'm an astronomer. And hopefully you guys all know what that means. That is someone who stares at the sky or more likely their computer for way too long in any one period of time. So that's what I'm doing. And what I'm doing at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory out here in Pasadena, California, is I'm interested in trying to find and answer that ultimate question of are we alone? Is there life out there? Are, or are we all alone in the universe? But in order to find aliens, we first have to find out where they live. And this idea, this study of extrasolar planets is actually one of the newest fields in astronomy. It's about 20 to 30 years old, depending on how you count. And while this field in astronomy is relatively new, it's actually the idea of extrasolar planets, planets outside of our solar system, of life beyond our own solar system is nothing new. So for example, <clears throat> 
Um, little quick aside about history. I'm married to a historian and she's in the room next door with the dog. And if I do not show the slide, she will bust out of the room and cancel this live feed. So I, I am legally obligated to show the slide. So Giordano Bruno, he's the Emperor Palpatine guy looking at the right. He was a 16th century philosopher who postulated that there's other worlds outside of our own solar system, potentially with life on them as well. And Isaac Newton, he's the guy that invented Fig Newtons, right? But he's also the guy that discovered or, or talked about and described the theory of gravity. And in that same book where he described gravity in Principia, he said, and if the fixed stars are the centers of similar systems, they will all be constructed to a similar design. In other words, we have eight planets, eight, because Pluto's on a planet, guys, sorry. We have eight planets orbiting around our own sun. So it stands to reason that when we go out into the night and we look up at the night sky and we look up at all the stars in the sky, that there are probably planets also orbiting those stars. And we now know today that these two dead guys are absolutely correct. Today, we've discovered over 4,000 exoplanets. And thanks to missions like NASA's Kepler mission, which I'll be coming back to again a little bit later, we now know that there's at least one exoplanet for every single star in the sky. So in other words, exoplanets are everywhere. And if there's lots of exoplanets, perhaps there's also life elsewhere in the galaxy. So how do we find life? Well, it's a three easy step method, right? You just find an exoplanet, determine if it can support life, and then you actually have to find the life itself. So let's explore how we find an exoplanet. There's actually a bunch of different methods that we can use to find exoplanets. The three I'm gonna be focusing on today are the radial velocity method, the transit method, and the direct imaging method. From the radial velocity and the transit method, these arguably have given us the most information on the most number of exoplanets we know today. And direct imaging, there's some really cool um, groundwork that's being laid and some really cool technology developments that are happening at places all around the world that are looking into this technology. So we're getting a question right now, and it is what has been my least expected exoplanet related discovery? So one of the things that I have been uh, fortunate to learn in exoplanets is to expect the unexpected. And I'll be getting this a little bit later. So at this point in my career, anything that is interesting and new is actually just really cool. And it doesn't really surprise me that exoplanets are challenging what we know and think about exoplanets. So I'll circle around back to that in a second. So let's look a little bit more in depth on the radial velocity method. So the radial velocity method, what it does is it is the Doppler method is what it's also called. So in that image on the right, we have an exoplanet that's orbiting around a star. Now we know that the star's gravity tugs the exoplanet and causes the planet to orbit around the star but the planet is also gravitationally influencing the star as well. So as the planet moves, the star also wobbles back and forth. So if we measure the light of that star, which is that spectrum, that rainbow in the bottom right of the screen, we can actually watch the star wobble towards us and away from us. As an exoplanet orbits around that star and tugs the host star towards us and away from us. And this is a really great method because this actually allows us to basically measure the mass of these exoplanets. We are able to weigh them in a sense because the bigger the exoplanet, the bigger the wobble on the host star to and from. The smaller the planet, the smaller the wobble. And this only gives us the motion along the line of sight. We only see this Doppler effect if it's coming towards us and away from us. If the motion is happening perpendicular to us, we will not see that Doppler shift. So you probably actually encountered the Doppler shift in your own lives. So if you're ever walking down a street in a really loud car or a race car and ambulance passes you by, you notice that the pitch increases as the, 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 the race car or the ambulance is closer to you. And that's because the sound waves are being compressed. And as the sound waves compress, the wavelength gets shorter and the frequency increases. So the pitch increases. And as the race car or the ambulance drives away from you, you'll notice that the pitch decreases because those sound waves are being stretched out. And that is the Doppler method for sound. And since light behaves sometimes like a wave, light also experiences the Doppler shift. 
So you can watch the red shift and the blue shift as a target comes towards us and away from us and measure this Doppler effect and weigh the exoplanet orbiting around the host star. So there's a bunch of advantage of this, uh, advantages of this method. As I mentioned before, this gives us the mass of the planet. This allows us to weigh the planets themselves. However, there's some disadvantages. We're biased towards large periods, uh, large planets and short period orbits. So if I measure a Doppler shift of a planet orbiting around its star every three days, that's only three days I have to wait to see that entire Doppler shift motion. But if I have a planet now orbiting around its star every year, that's 365 days I now have to observe that exoplanet. So we're sort of biased towards short period planets. Also, if you want to discover an Earth-sized planet, we need fairly large telescopes, like NASA's 10-meter Keck telescopes. These are roughly 30-foot large telescopes, and there's a picture of those, uh, the two telescopes, the two Keck telescopes at the top right on Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. So that's the radial velocity method. Now let's go take a look at the transit method. The transit method is honestly my, one of my favorites because when I was a graduate student, this is what I specialized in. And the transit method is a method where we actually look at an exoplanet going in front of a star, blocking out the star's light and casting a shadow on the Earth's surface. So this animation, I'm showing an exoplanet passing in front of its star. And as the planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out some of the star's light and the star becomes a little bit dimmer. And that measure in the dip in the brightness of the host star tells us roughly how big that exoplanet is relative to its host star. So let's watch this animation one more time. So right now we're measuring the brightness of the host star. And as the planet passes in front of the host star, it blocks out some of the host star's light. So the bigger the dip in brightness, the bigger the planet. The smaller the dip in brightness, the smaller the planet. But this, this effect can be very hard to look for. At best, the dip in brightness is roughly on the order of a percent. But this is really important again, because this allows us to measure the radius of the planet to the star. This method, which I'll describe a little bit later, allows us to also study the planet's atmosphere. We can actually observe the atmosphere of these exoplanets and then understand the composition of these exoplanets to eventually maybe find things that might be indicative of life. And this method has been used to discover 3,000 of the 4,000 currently known exoplanets. So the transit method has arguably given us the most numbers wise of the known exoplanets that we know of today. So some advantages of this transit method is this actually can be relatively cheap. So on Reddit a few years ago, I saw someone that had a DSLR camera on a little barn door tracker, just a camera alone, and they were able to observe a transit of a large Jupiter-sized planet orbiting around its host star. Again, this also tells us how big the planet is relative to its host star, its radius of the planet. But the disadvantages are, just like the radial velocity method, we're gonna be biased towards large planets in short period orbits because bigger planets block out more light. So let's look at this quick little setup here. Here's my host star, it's my ceiling lamp. So let's pretend I have an exoplanet that's pretty big, my fist, okay? As my exoplanet passes in front of the star, it's really easy to see my fist or that large exoplanet like the size of Jupiter blocking out the star's light. But now, let's pretend we wanna look at an Earth-sized planet, like my finger, right? As my finger passes in front of the light of my my ceiling fan, it's a lot harder to see that dip in brightness. So we're biased towards looking at big planets because it's easier to see them. Also, you can have false detections. And just like with the radial velocity method, in order to see that planet blocking out its star, it has to be on that edge on field uh, um, orientation. If it's perpendicular to your line of sight, the planet will never block out the star's light and we will not see a transit occur. So remember how I mentioned uh, that over 3,000 exoplanets have been discovered by the transit method? Well, a lot of them have been discovered thanks to NASA's Kepler and K2 missions. So Kepler was a NASA planet hunter launched in 2009, and it's discovered and confirmed over 2,000 exoplanets. 
in a tiny little portion of the sky. So in that figure on the top right, there's Kepler sort of floating in space. And what Kepler did is it pointed to this one little patch of sky that was roughly the size of the full moon. It was right by Cygnus the swan, which I'm showing there. So in that tiny little patch of sky, Kepler found thousands of transiting exoplanets. So if we take that little patch of sky and now extrapolate it to the entire sky, Kepler is the reason that we know that exoplanets are everywhere, that there's at least as many exoplanets as there are stars in the sky. And a lot of these discoveries of transiting exoplanets and exoplanets in general, these two big bumps right here at 2015 and 2016, those were actually uh, two large Kepler data releases. So Kepler unfortunately has died. It's a uh, reaction wheels have failed, but it's okay because now we have a new mission that was launched a little while ago called TESS. And TESS is an all sky survey. So where Kepler primarily looked at only one portion of the sky, TESS is now observing the entire sky. And it's predicted that TESS might discover 10,000 or more transiting exoplanets. So right now we know about 4,000. TESS might discover an additional 10,000 exoplanets. And this is great because the transiting method is a way that we're actually able to study exoplanets with NASA space telescopes. So the Hubble Space Telescope is using the transit method to look at tens of planets. James Webb, that's the successor to Hubble. It's uh, currently being uh, tested and built right now. And this is uh, the James Webb Space Telescope or J WST. It's an absolutely massive telescope. The size of that golden mirror right there is like uh, about six feet across. And um, uh, underneath that uh, size of the solar shield is about the size of a full tennis court. So it's an absolutely massive telescope. And then Ariel, which is a European space agency, will look at hundreds to thousands of planets. And we'll be using the transit method to look for signs of atmospheric composition to figure out what these planets are made out of and uh, to potentially even look for signs of life. But in order to look at a transit, we have to know exactly when that planet is going to pass in front of its star. Ah, so we have a great question that just came in and is how can we tell the difference between really small eclipsing binaries and hot Jupiter transits? So for those who don't know, an eclipsing binary are two stars that orbit around each other. Just like if you've seen Star Wars A New Hope, right, on Tatooine, it was a twin star, it was a binary star. So how do you know if it's actually two stars orbiting around each other or if it's a planet orbiting around a star? And the way that you can do that is by the shape of the dips when the planet passes in front of and behind the star. So a binary star system will produce two smooth U-shaped dips as it goes in front and behind the star, as the two stars eclipse each other. When the planet goes behind the star, it's gonna look a lot more angular and the sizes are gonna be uh, very much different. So there are ways we can tell differences between eclipsing binaries, double stars like in Tatooine, and actually finding the Tatooines themselves, the planets orbiting any of these stars. So again, if we wanted to look at an, a transit of these exoplanets to actually watch the planet pass in front of its star and to measure that planet and look at its atmosphere, we need to keep things fresh. We need to know exactly when that transit event is going to occur. Because if I think that, let me try to do this really quick. So if I think my transit is occurring here in this red dash line, but really my transit is occurring here in the black line, I run the risk of partially missing my transit. So in other words, let's say I think my transit is gonna to happen tomorrow at nine o'clock, but there's actually a 15 minute uncertainty of when that transit is going to occur. So if I wanted to look at that transit, the large space telescope, that means I have to add an extra 15 minutes of buffer in my observations to make sure I observe that transit. So 15 minutes doesn't sound like a lot, but on large space telescopes, we're they're very expensive and time is very, very precious because you want to do as much science as we can with these large telescopes. You want to eliminate any of that uncertainty so you can better know when to observe those, those exoplanets with large telescopes. But luckily, here's where actually amateur astronomers can step in. So amateur astronomers can actually help observe transiting exoplanets with their own telescopes. So this uh, picture on the right is actual data taken of an exoplanet 
passing in front of its host star and partially blocking out the star's light. And this was taken by a single six inch telescope. And this host star is relatively dim. For those who are amateur astronomers in the house or astronomy people, it's a, a VMAG of 11.289, so fairly dim for a small telescope. And despite that, we're actually able to get extremely precise measurements of the transit of this exoplanet. So in other words, if we know there's a planet that has a large uncertainty of when it will pass in front of its star, we can actually use small telescopes to tell us exactly when that transit is going to occur so we don't waste time on large telescopes. So we, don't, we can use them more efficiently and more effectively to do as much science as possible. So what I'm uh, doing is I'm, I'm helping lead a project called Exoplanet Watch. And this is actually a, a citizen science project where people can help us routinely observe high priority transiting exoplanets. And this data will be immediately public to the entire community, both the public and also the astronomy communities. And if you are wanting to be an exoplanet watch observer and you present and uh, contribute observations to a published paper, you will be listed as a co-author on these published papers. And we're starting beta testing right now and we'll be doing official launch in summer 2020. If you want to get more information about this or if you're interested in signing up as a beta tester, if you have your own telescope, that's great. You can be an observer. If you don't have your own telescope, let me know and we might be able to hook you up with some old data that we actually have that's desperately needing to be reduced. So in order to look up this project, just Google NASA Exoplanet Watch. We also have this really cool data reduction program that actually takes, if you're an amateur astronomer, it actually takes your raw images and produces a light curve. So it actually fully takes those raw images and reduces them and measures them and tells you how big that planet is and how, uh, when it will next transit its host star. One cool thing if you're ever at star parties is it actually does a real time reduction. So when you're looking at a transiting exoplanet, you can actually point to your computer screen and say, look, we're actually looking at a planet right now, passing in front of its host star, and it's hundreds of millions of miles away, which is really cool. And that's available on that GitHub link, and it's also linked off the Exoplanet Watch website as well. So again, we need you to help us beta test. So if you don't have any data, no problem. Talk to me later by contacting me through the Exoplanet Watch website on how to get free transit exo, uh, transiting the exoplanet data. We need you to help uh, test our, our reduction code. We'll be launching in September. You can contact me by my email address right there or also through our website. Okay, so I'll get off my soapbox for a minute. We've talked about the radial velocity method and we've talked about the transit method. But that third method is the direct imaging method. And as you could probably figure out from the title, the direct imaging method is how we take photographs of exoplanets. However, if you wanna take photos of exoplanets, there's a slight problem. This, the problem is, is that how do you take a picture of an exoplanet orbiting around its very, very bright host star? So let's, for example, make this a little bit easier. Let's take a large planet, like the size of Jupiter. It's pretty big compared to Earth, right? Let's heat it up and make it really hot. So it burns really bright. It, it emits a lot of light. Now, if we put that Jupiter-sized exoplanet around a star the same size and brightness of our, our own sun, it's like looking for a firefly orbiting around a lighthouse and you're about a mile away. Because that Jupiter is a million times fainter, just like the firefly is a million times fainter than its lighthouse. But now let's push the boundaries. Jupiter-sized planets are all cool, um, but we really want to find life eventually, right? So let's look for an Earth-like exoplanet. Much smaller, it's much cooler than our hot exo-Jupiter. It's actually 10 billion times fainter than its host star. That's like looking for just one bioluminescent alga around that same lighthouse. So the question is, how do you suppress the light? How do we get rid of the light from our bright star so you can see the tiny little planet orbiting around the star. And this is where we use the direct imaging method. So right now we're taking a picture of an exoplanet, of a host star, back this up. So there's actually a host star that actually has an exoplanet orbiting around it. So what we can do is like when we go in the, in the daytime, right? 
and the sun's burning really bright and you can't see, so you sort of block your eyes from the sun. Well, we can do the same exact thing. We can build something called a chronograph, which will move in front of our star and block out the star's light, allowing us to see the dimmer light of the exoplanet orbiting around it. So if any of you went to the solar eclipse that happened a few years ago across the continental US, remember when the moon passed in front of the sun and then you're able to see the stars around the sun or even the corona of the sun. So you can basically simulate a lunar eclipse by putting a chronograph, basically a disc or a mask in front of that host star to block out the star's light, letting us see the very dim planets orbiting around that star. So I have a quick little video. Let me enable my audio really quick, one sec. If you guys can give me a thumbs up if you hear the audio, that'd be great. A coronagraph is a way to see distant planets hidden by the glare of the star they orbit. The coronagraph reduces the light coming directly from the star to separate it from the light reflected by the planet. WFIRST doesn't block the star's light with an opaque disk as a simple coronagraph might. Instead, it uses a combination of disks with complex patterns and light blocking stops to create destructive interference with the star's light, effectively making it disappear while allowing the light from planets to pass through. A complicating factor is that the light picks up small distortions as it reflects off the telescope's series of mirrors, and these distortions can reduce the effectiveness of the destructive interference. Collecting more light increases the image signal, but the planets are still hidden under blobs of leftover, distorted starlight. To remove these blobs, the coronagraph has special deformable mirrors that can change shape by using hundreds of tiny pistons. This corrects the distortions in the light beam. As the mirrors deform, the blobs of light slowly begin to disappear, revealing brighter planets. Further adjustment brings fainter planets into view. Advanced software processes this data, further improving the contrast and clarity of the image. This processing makes objects more than a billion times fainter than the star visible. As a result, WFIRST will provide the first look at individual planets in star systems that might be similar to our own. So that's basically how a chronograph works. So I'll be talking a little bit more about WFIRST and CGI a little bit later, but basically a chronograph works by magic, right? You have a disc, basically, that goes in front and blocks up the star's light. And by suppressing the light of the host star, we're then able to see the very dim exoplanet orbiting around that star. <clears throat> so, uh, we actually have a question from the audience was, uh, have we used different techniques, radial velocity, the transit method, visual uh, direct imaging method, microlensing to confirm the same exoplanet properties. And largely what we've been using these different methods for is they all tell us different parts of the puzzle. So the radial velocity allows us to measure the mass of the exoplanet. The transit method allows us to measure the radius of the exoplanet. The direct imaging method is really helpful because it allows us to block out the star's light and always, almost always see the exoplanet orbiting around its host star. We're getting to the point where I believe we have yet to make an observation using two different techniques that confirm each other in the sense that uh, if we see water using the transit method, we also see it during the direct imaging method. So I don't think that's actually happened just quite yet. That's a great question from the audience. So again, that's how we image exoplanets, basically by using really cool technology in space. So here's actually some real direct imaging observations of a multi-planet system. So at the very center, there's that dark disk. That's actually the chronograph that's passed in front of the star and blocked out the star's light. And when we suppress or block out the star's light, you can actually see the tiny little exoplanets orbiting around the star. So here's one right here. Here's one right here. Here's one right here. And here's one right here. This is the four planet system, HR 8799. And this data set is taking roughly seven to 10 years. So by continuously monitoring this exoplanet system, we can actually watch all these exoplanets orbiting around its host star. So this is uh, really cool because we're actually observing another solar system, an extrasolar solar system. Okay, 
so now what? I've you know just hammered away about you know all these various detection techniques. We've discovered over four thousand exoplanets. Great, but how do we take the next step from planet detection to finding exoplanets to now actually characterizing these exoplanets? For example, we want to answer a question, does it have an atmosphere? What molecules are present in the atmosphere of that exoplanet? Could that exoplanet support life? And if so, if that planet potentially has the conditions that could support life, does it have life? So this brings us to our next step. How do we determine, once we found an exoplanet, that it can support life? And one of the stepping stones we use is something called the habitable zone. You've probably heard of this before called the Goldilocks zone. So this is the zone where liquid water can exist on a planet's surface. So if we take this top down view of the solar system, here's the sun, Mercury and Venus are a little bit too close to the sun. So they're too hot. So any water on their surface just boils off. Mars, unfortunately, is just a little bit too far away. So uh, water has a very hard time surviving on its surface. Earth is just in the right zone. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, and we can have liquid water survive on its surface. And the reason that we care about liquid water is because life as we know it requires liquid water to survive. Yes, this is applying a very biased Earth-centric view to the rest of the universe. But if we look at our own solar system, which has only eight planets, of those eight planets and the tens to hundreds of moons that are in our own solar system, only one thing has life on it, just one, and that is the Earth. And as far as we see, and as far as we can tell, all life on Earth requires liquid water to survive. So this is very exciting because uh, a few years ago, there was a discovery of an extrasolar planet called TRAPPIST-1. And this is a multi-planet system. And all these planets right here are roughly the size of the Earth. They're terrestrial type planets. And these three planets right here, E, F, and G, are all in the habitable zone of their host star. So potentially, one of these three planets might actually have life on their surface. So it's pretty incredible. We've discovered the first exoplanet in the mid-90s. And now, thanks to missions like Kepler and TESS and numerous ground-based surveys, we now know of over 4,000 exoplanets. So we've gone from discovering exoplanets to discovering a ton of exoplanets in just a few years to now potentially discovering an exoplanet that might have life on its surface. But how do we take the next step? How do we say, okay, here's an exoplanet. From the transit method, we know it's roughly the size of the Earth. We know that it's roughly the right distance from its star, so it's not too hot, it's not too cold. If it had water on its surface, it could survive on the surface, and that could maybe make life, you know, be happy. But then how do we conclusively detect that? How do we then take the next step and say, what are the atmospheric compositions of planets E, F, and G? Do they actually have water in their atmosphere? Do they have other things that we need in our own atmosphere, for example, like carbon dioxide, like methane, like ozone, like carbon monoxide? Do those planets also have those molecules? And this is where we use a law called Beer's Law. So Beer's Law is a way that we can actually study the atmospheres of exoplanets just by looking at their light. So here's actually a quick definition of Beer's Law. This is studying for a test or doing homework while Beer is involved, making difficult classes such as physical chemistry more bearable. That's probably a Beer's Law. It's not the Beer's Law I was actually thinking about. So let's, let's just move out of the way on this one. So here's actually Beer's law. This is the absorption and scattering out of a light beam. So let's pretend that we're looking in a lab at a chamber of gas right here. And this chamber of gas, the cylinder is full of carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide or methane or even water vapor. Now, if we put a light bulb behind that chamber of gas and we shine the light through the chamber, we'll notice that the light bulb looks a little bit dimmer. And this chamber of gas will actually absorb the light of the light bulb 
differently at different wavelengths according to this equation here. This will be on the quiz after the talk, guys. You better memorize that. I'm kidding, there's no quiz. So example, if this chamber of gas is full of methane, it'll absorb wavelengths of light at these, wave, at these passbands. If that chamber of gas has oxygen or water, it'll absorb at these wavelengths. So it's a lot like looking at a fingerprint or a barcode. By looking at how this chamber of gas blocks out light differently at different wavelengths, allows us to infer the actual um, composition of that gas. So let's look at some real examples. So here we have a star and we have an astronomer observing that star. Now that star that's yellow is emitting yellow light. So we observe this star as yellow. But if we put a cloud of gas in the way, that gas cloud will absorb some of that light and make the light look a little bit redder. So the light was yellow, now the light is red. So if you can observe what an object does look like and compare it to what it should look like, we can use Beer's law to determine the composition of the absorbing species. So then we can infer that that cloud of gas has molecules in its atmosphere. So we can figure out what things are made of, just how they absorb and emit and reflect light. So let's take this now to an exoplanet example. So let's take an exoplanet that's really young. And when exoplanets, when planets form, they uh, start to uh, condense onto each other. All that uh, dust and gas start to form a large ball that becomes eventually an exoplanet. And when that stuff is all condensing, it produces a lot of heat through friction. So the center of this planet, shown as that yellow sphere right there, is very warm. But that young uh, core of that planet, it's very hot, so it emits heat. And that heat and that light escapes through the outer layers of the atmosphere of the planet itself. And as they travel outside of the planet's atmosphere, those light waves start getting absorbed by the atmosphere of the planet itself. So when they originally started out, they were yellow. When they were emitted outside the planet's surface, they're red. So now we're able to see astronomers are able to determine what the composition of that exoplanet's atmosphere is. So you can say that that planet has methane in its atmosphere. Similarly, let's look at, the Ju at Jupiter orbiting around the sun. So the sun, it emits yellow light. When that yellow light hits Jupiter's surface, it's reflected a little bit differently because Jupiter has various species in its atmosphere that reflect and emit light differently at different wavelengths. And Jupiter, comparatively in this little example, it will reflect redder light towards us. So we can actually look at how light and astronomers can actually look at how light is reflected from these objects and figure out, for example, that this planet has clouds in its atmosphere. So again, Beer's law allows us to characterize an exoplanet's composition by observing how it emits, absorbs, and reflects light. So this is how we're able to characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets that are hundreds upon millions of miles away from us just by looking at their light. We don't even have to go there. So it's a very, very powerful technique. So here's actually some example exoplanet data. So right here, we have a bunch of different exoplanets along this axis in all these various colors. And then along this axis, this is basically how hot they are with warmer planets up top and cooler planets down below. Hotter planets emit more light, so that's why they're up top. And cooler planets, because they're colder, uh, emit less infrared light, so they're at the bottom. And along this axis is wavelength. So what we've done is we've taken the light from these exoplanets and we put them through a prism to spread out their light and look at how they emit, absorb, and reflect light as a function of wavelength. And here, these are the passbands that are sensitive to looking for water in the atmosphere of these exoplanets. So if I see a bump or wiggle at these wavelengths, I can infer that that planet has water in its atmosphere. Right here, these are the wavelengths that are very sensitive to, to methane absorption. 
So again, if I see a feature at these wavelengths, I can infer that that planet has methane in its atmosphere. And the same thing for carbon monoxide. If I see a bumper wiggle at this wavelength, I can infer that that planet has carbon monoxide in its atmosphere. But right here, you might have noticed that there's actually these gaps in the data. So can anyone guess what these gaps in the data are? I'll give you 10 seconds to figure that out while I get a sip of water. All right, if any of you guessed that it's actually the Earth's atmosphere, you are absolutely correct. This is actually where the Earth's own atmosphere gets in the way. Where Earth, because Earth actually has water in its atmosphere and that manifests as blocking out those wavelengths that I've highlighted in red. So if the Earth's atmosphere gets in the way of looking at the atmospheres of these exoplanets, this is a ground-based data set, by the way. Then what are we to do? Well, the answer is to go up into space. So this is why space missions are very, very helpful and necessary for astronomy, because they're able to look above the Earth's atmosphere and uh, to look at these wavelengths that are not accessible from the ground. The Hubble Space Telescope, for example, has an, a few instruments on board. One of them is the Wide Field Camera 3, that looks at that blue wavelengths primarily that I've highlighted on the figure on the right. And these blue wavelengths happen to line up with water absorption. So Hubble has been very successful about looking for the presence of water in the atmospheres of these exoplanets. So right here, this is actually a 30 planet sample of uh, data taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. At the top left, this bump and wiggle is actually the characteristic signal or shape of water in an exoplanet atmosphere. And you'll notice that this bump goes away the farther we go down this plot. This exoplanet, for example, right here is relatively flat. And the reason that this planet spectrum is relatively flat is because there's clouds in the atmosphere of that planet. Water exists on that planet's surface, on this planet's atmosphere, likely but clouds are above the water layer. So when we try to look into the atmosphere of the planet, we can't penetrate through the clouds that are absorbing the light. So that's why we don't see a water feature and it looks relatively flat. So I mentioned that this 30 planet sample, these planets all have water in their atmospheres. However, all of these planets are way too hot for liquid water to exist in their atmospheres. These are all water vapor or steam in the atmospheres of these exoplanets. Another mission, which was recently uh, retired a few months ago, was the Spitzer Space Telescope. And Spitzer was an awesome instrument because it observed in the infrared. And I was lucky enough to be part of a study that observed a transit of an exoplanet. And we we're actually able to continuously look at this exoplanet transit for nearly 100 continuous hours. So right here is the transit where the planet blocks up the star's light. In this bottom panel, it's just the, the top portion uh, just zoomed in a little bit. Right here, you'll see that uh, these additional bumps right here, these additional dips. This is actually an eclipse where the planet passed behind the star. So earlier we had a question from uh, Juan asking, how can we tell the difference between, oh, sorry, from uh, STR River, how can you tell the difference between eclipsing binaries and hot Jupiter transits, and it's these eclipse signals. So again, if you see a boxy shape like that, that is very likely that it is a Jupiter and not a small star instead. Uh, this is also a really cool study because we're able to uh, continuously observe as this exoplanet orbited around its star. And we were actually able to map out and watch as the star orbited around, the planet orbited around its star. So we we're actually able to watch the entire surface of the planet rotate in and out of our, our field of view. And we can actually map out the temperature variations around this exoplanet. So we're able to figure out that this side where we get that large bump that increase in light is really hot. 
And then this decrease in brightness is comparatively cold. And this exoplanet, one side is 400 degrees hotter than the other. And because there's such a huge difference between the hot side and the cold side of this exoplanet, winds are actually transporting the heat from the hot side to the cold side. And these winds actually exceed the speed of sound. So exoplanets, we were at, I was asked earlier if there are any weird discoveries of exoplanets. And the thing is exoplanets are just super, super weird that anything unexpected at this point sort of feels expected because they've just been challenging how we think about planets because there's so many different exoplanets out there. Earlier, I quickly mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope. This will be doing spectroscopy using the spectroscopic method to look at the spectra, how light varies with wavelength of over 200 transiting exoplanets. And again, that golden mirror right there, it's absolutely enormous. It's about six meters. I think I said six feet before, it's actually six meters. So roughly almost 30 feet in diameter. And again, this purple portion on the bottom, that's a sun shield, and that's the size of a tennis court. This telescope is so giant that it actually unfolds like origami when it gets into orbit after being launched from the earth. It's absolutely insane. And, and it's super cool. And I'm really excited when it, it finally gets launched, hopefully in the next year or so. So I'm very much looking forward to James Webb because Hubble has now looked at the spectra of roughly tens of planets. And James Webb, since it is so much larger, since it has increased capability in terms of more wavelengths, more instrumentation, it'll really allow us to transform what we know and think we know about exoplanets. Another mission that I have the, the joy of working on at JPL is a mission called the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, or WFIRST. This is actually roughly the same size as Hubble, but it will have 100 times the field of view due to the design of its mirrors. And this will study things like astrophysics, dark energy, and exoplanets. It'll actually use two methods, the microlensing method, but also the direct imaging method. And I work on the instrument at JPL that studies uh, the direct imaging method with this telescope. And this will be launching roughly in 2025. So again, I, uh, I'm really lucky that I get to work on WFIRST chronograph or CGI, the chronograph instrument. And so why do we need a chronograph on a telescope when we can already do these observations in the ground? We have large ground based telescopes like Keck, like Gemini, eight meter telescopes already able to do direct imaging to look at exoplanets. Well, if we look at the state of the art in the field right now, current ground based observations are largely limited to infrared light. And these types of observations are typically se are sensitive to young, hot super Jupiters. These are planets that are relatively still warm. They're really hot actually, because they just formed and they're orbiting far from their star. And these are large planets. So they're big, they're bright, they're easier to see. What CGI will do with W first, um, it'll take the first visible light image and spectrum of a cool Jupiter-like exoplanet. So we'll basically, basically be able to push in that boundary a little bit closer. We can go at cooler targets. We can go at targets that are orbiting more close to their host star. And we can look at them in reflected light. There's a question earlier about the periodic variation and the relative flux, a result of the star being variable. I believe that was about the Spitzer slide. Um, so let me quickly come to that. So this variation that I'm showing, the dip and uh, drop in the brightness is actually due to variations from the exoplanet itself. However, stellar variability can actually influence your observations. So you actually have to take that into account. Good question. So W first with this chronograph, we'll be able to look at true Jupiter analogs, Jupiter-like planets orbiting around stars like our own sun. And this is absolutely necessary because this mission will provide the stepping stone from where we are to where we wanna be. We want to eventually look at these small Earth-like planets orbiting around their host stars. And we will want to look for things like biosignatures to figure out where life is.
Another mission that I'm working on is CASE. This is a contribution to an ESA, a European Space Agency mission. that will look at over a thousand exoplanets. So it'll really place those James Webb observations in a nice statistical basis. So um, I'm really excited and lucky that I'm working on that as well. So again, uh, why even bother with the ground? You know, space observatories, they allow us to look around the Earth's atmosphere. They get away from all that transmission uh, issues that we have. We don't have to worry about sunlight, we don't have to worry about weather, you know, um, but they're limited both in available time and wavelength. There's only a handful of space observatories. However, there are tons of ground-based observatories and tons of instrumentation. And true, the Earth's atmosphere and gravity can induce uncertainties in our data sets, and it makes it difficult to observe exoplanets. Ground-based observatories and telescopes are still completely, completely necessary to understanding exoplanets and astronomy in general. One uh, instrument I'm working at at Palomar, just outside of San Diego, is an instrument called NESI. And NESI is actually an instrument purposely built to study the atmospheres of exoplanets. And we're gonna be starting a survey of that, hopefully uh, in the next few months or so. So right here is a picture of Nessie. No, that's a mythical sea monster. Here's a real picture of Nessie. So that is the instrument on its handling cart, uh, the blue thing right here. There's these computers, uh, and I'm actually taking some measurements of Nessie and making sure it works in the lab. And Nessie actually sits at the top of this telescope. So we have to lift it from the ground floor above Palomar. And Palomar is a 200 inch telescope. It's a very historic telescope. It used to be the world's largest for over 50 years. So um, when we first started pulling up over the telescope, we were hoping that our insurance policy had started. This is our instrument principal investigator, Michelle Creech Ekman. She's a professor at New Mexico Tech. You can see she has an I want to believe Nessie shirt on. There's my boss taking a cool glory shot of, of Nessie being lifted up into space really hoping that our insurance policy had started and we're not gonna wreck a historic telescope mirror. But long story short is luckily it did make it up into the top of the telescope. So here's Nessie at the top of the telescope. We're doing some tests. There's my boss, Mark, he's smiling. He's actually laughing at me because remember, I am definitely afraid of heights. But since I'm one of the commissioning leads of Nessie, that means I still have to go to the top of the observatory. So he's actually very much laughing at me for being so scared. But it's worth it because you have this really cool photo of Nessie at the top of the telescope. And there's my feet, so it's sort of like a weird selfie. And we just a few months ago got observations of a transiting exoplanet. So we're hopefully going to be going back up to the telescope in the next few months or so, hopefully, to look at more transiting exoplanets with Nessie. So I talked about how we find an exoplanet. There are various, many different ways that we can use to find and detect exoplanets. We can also determine if it can support life by looking for things that life needs to survive. If it's in the habitable zone, if it has water, if it has methane, if it has the molecules that life needs to survive. But how we take the next step, just because we find a planet that could have life, doesn't mean it does have life. So we actually have to find it. So how do we find life? Well, let's launch a, a satellite out into space. And as it's going out into orbit, we can have it turn around and point its instrumentation back at the Earth. And we can analyze the reflected, emitted, and absorbed light from the Earth and its surface and its atmosphere to look for evidence of oxygen. We can look for liquid water. We can look for things like cow farts, right? Biological activity like methane. However, we have to rule out all other explanations. We find, we're finding actively methane on exoplanets. We're finding water in their atmospheres. So how do, we, um, how do we rule out all explanations so we know without a, a, any doubt that that planet has life on its surface? Another way we can do it is we can actually just try to talk to aliens. So Voyager 1 and 2, which was built by JPL, um, in the 70s, this actually did a grand tour of the solar system. And on board, um, get my pointer, right here, it had these golden records. And these golden records were actually designed by a committee chaired by Carl Sagan. And right here, this is directions on how to start up your, your phonograph or your record. 
Here's the correct frequency that you run it out. Actually, the phonograph also had pictures. So this is how you'd construct a little TV to show it. Here's molecular hydrogen. And right here, here's the position of the Earth relative to a bunch of different pulsars. So you can say, hey, here's how you listen to us say hello. Here's some pictures of Earth. And here's how you find us to eventually enslave our entire life, right? Perfect. Another way you can uh, look for alien life is through SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And they actually sent messages to aliens. So back in 1974, Frank Drake and Carl Sagan wrote actually a message to aliens. And they used, at the time, Arecibo. This was the world's largest, now the second largest radio telescope in existence. It's actually so big that it actually sits in a valley between these mountains. And they sent a message to this very dense star field that looked exactly like this. So at the top, this is displaying that we know how to count. So you know about numbers. Here, this is describing uh, different elements. Right here, you probably have guessed as a human. Right here, this double helix is actually DNA. And here is a solar system. Here's the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth. It's elevated, that's where we're from. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And guys, this is in 1974 when they didn't know any better and they thought Pluto was a planet. But now we know better, Pluto's on a planet. They're just wrong, it's okay. And right here, this purple thing is a radio dish. So this is Arecibo. So it says, hey guys, we're humans. This is what we look like. We know how to count, we know about molecules, we know about DNA, here's where we live. Come and enslave us, right? Perfect. Another thing you can do is send out social media messages to aliens because nothing bad happens on the internet, right guys? So back in 2008, they sent a message from a social networking site called Bebo. They sent 501 messages to this planetary system called Gliese 581. And this system has two planets, C and D, that might be in the habitable zone and might have life on their surface. Well, Gliese 581C is 20.3 light years away. So these messages will arrive there in about nine years. And if they reply immediately, we'll get that response in 2049, which is kind of cool to think about. So these messages from 2008 were probably all about like how much they love Justin Bieber and such. So maybe we'll see if the, the aliens are actually One Direction fans. We'll see how that goes. So to wind down finally to my talk, where are we now? So unfortunately, and despite what the History Channel might tell you, we have yet to make any conclusive detection of extraterrestrial life. So why? Why haven't we found aliens? Exoplanets are everywhere. There's probably life out there. And I honestly think that there's probably life out there somewhere else in the universe. Why haven't we found them? Well, maybe our technology isn't good enough, right? So it wasn't until about 20, 30 years ago that we had the right technology to look for those little bumps and wiggles telling us the existence of an exoplanet orbiting around its host star. Alternatively, maybe we just haven't found them yet. Maybe they're talking from over here and we've been looking in this direction. Uh, Jill Tarter, Dr. Jill Tarter, she was actually the inspiration for the book and movie Contact by Carl Sagan. She actually put it in a great way. If we took the entire universe and shrunk it down into the size of the Earth's oceans, we still, despite all we know and how much we know about and, and, and understand the universe, we still only explored the equivalent of a glass of water. So while we know a ton, there is still a lot more for us to discover and understand. Or maybe most depressingly, maybe we are all just alone. So I'll leave you on a little bit better note. We have this excellent foundation that's been given to us in exoplanet science by ground-based telescopes that are continuing to do excellent science and make transformative observations of exoplanets. Hubble has been looking at tens of exoplanets through spectroscopy to look for water, Spitzer, has allowed us to look into the climate and the weather of these exoplanets. Kepler has discovered thousands of exoplanets. TESS will discover potentially another 10,000 more. James Webb, that giant telescope, will look at in exquisite detail the spectra of these exoplanets, perhaps looking and maybe finding, hopefully, some signs of life. W first will use the direct imaging method to block out the light of its host star and start to look at Jupiter-sized planets orbiting around those stars. And these missions that were built by NASA and these missions that were also built by the European Space Agency have given us an excellent foundation for the next generation of spacecraft. 
And we're now looking at uh, four new missions, we'll, one of which will be selected for launch. that will be a successor to the current round of exoplanet missions. Three of the four, Louvoir, Habex, and Origins Space Telescope, three of the four of those are explicitly designed to look for life. And one of these spacecraft, if they're chosen to fly, will potentially be launched as early as 2030 or in the 2030s. And perhaps in the next one to two decades, we'll finally be able to answer that question, are we alone in the universe? So thank you again for your time and your patience. And I'll take any questions right now. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, so we will have uh, about five, 10 minutes uh, to see if anyone wants to um, ask questions in the chat. We have a couple questions on the Zoom group chat. Yep, so one of them is uh, with so many exoplanets, how do we determine which ones to look at closely and which ones to ignore? So um, right now, we're basically looking at every single star in the sky with TESS. And TESS is looking at all these stars to look for exoplanets. But if our ultimate goal is to answer the question, are we alone in the universe? We're honestly, we're biasing ourselves to planets that we know potentially have life on them. Again, in our solar system, life only exists on Earth. So we're looking for small Earth-like, Earth-sized planets that are the right temperature where liquid water can survive on their surface. That doesn't mean we're ignoring the other ones. There's lots of people, including myself, that look at these other larger planets because it's very interesting to understand how they form, what's in their atmosphere, uh, what they're made of, and other questions like that. So great question. So another question that's coming in is, will we be able to detect more complex molecules such as tholins as well as the simpler basic molecules we detect now. So right now we're mostly detecting water, methane, other, other species like that, because they absorb very strongly at infrared light. And we have been tailoring emissions to look at infrared wavelengths because we're taking advantage of those light signatures. So uh, tholins are, are haze particles. They form, for example, on Titan, and they're very complex fractal patterns of molecules. And potentially with future missions, you could potentially actually look for the signature of tholins. And right now we're actually looking at other haze particles on existent exoplanets, like Jupiter-sized exoplanets. And that's actually a great question of what are these planets' atmospheres made out of? These haze particles in, in particular, where are they made out of? And this is actually an outstanding question in the field. And right now, um, this is actually a question that's currently being answered and being studied by a lot of smart people. Um, have I ever had the opportunity to connect with the folks in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, or did they operate independently? So actually in graduate school, I knew someone that did work at Arecibo. That's a radio astronomy, and I'm more of an infrared or visible light astronomer. So I'm a little bit different. I would love to eventually go one day and see that very historic, iconic uh, telescope. That'd be great. Any more? Okay, great, Rob. Um, so I guess we can uh, stop sharing and I'm just gonna thank everyone and just let everyone know um, what to expect next maybe. Oh, okay, well, it's a little bit too dark here. <laughs> Let me. Okay, much better. So, well, I'd like to thank everyone first uh, to joining us uh, for joining us tonight and also sticking around until now. Um, hopefully, you enjoyed the lecture and also learned about something exciting. So, as I uh, said before in the chat, we'll be sending out a survey in a couple of days to everyone who had registered um, just to collect feedback. So the survey will be completely anonymous and we'll only be seeing statistical results. 
um, having the evaluation would be very helpful for us and would definitely keep us running this kind of outreach events, both virtual and in person later um, for a longer time. So we would really appreciate your taking um, only a few minutes to complete the survey. Um, and someone asked if we will be running similar lect uh, lectures uh, in the future and the answer is definitely yes. And um, we will be reaching out to you and you will probably hear from us the same way you did this time. And there's also an option in the, in the survey response where you could uh, sign yourself up in the mail list. So if we have anything um, event organized, there also um, there might be telescope viewing and virtually uh, later. So if you're interested in those kind of event, um, definitely in include your contact information there and we'll be reaching out to you. So, um, well, thank you. I will let Rob um, to uh, take maybe the, the final couple questions. If, so we have another question. Yeah, there's one more question about exomoons. Um, so exomoons are, you know, just like moons orbiting around their their own exoplanet, because um, we have a moon orbiting around the Earth. We have many moons orbiting around Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune as well, and Pluto, <clears throat> even though Pluto's not a planet, right? So the question is, have we detected exomoons elsewhere out there? So I've actually saw a study a few months ago that came out that said that they tentatively detected the evidence and the signature of a moon orbiting around its uh, planet. And I don't remember what the, the outcome of that study eventually was. I think they were looking for confirmation observations of these potential detections of the moons. So definitely uh, keep your ear to the ground, uh, pay attention because there might actually be a, a discovery soon in the next few months that I confirm this exoplanet, this exomoon uh, detection. So I think that's all the questions. I just want to say thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again for having me. Really appreciate UCR for also hosting this. This has been a lot of fun. I hope everyone's doing okay and staying safe out there. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, that was a very fun lecture. And I personally also learned a lot. And um, yeah, um, I would also like to uh, give a big plus to our lovely volunteers who helped out uh, with uh, the, the chat room today. So, okay, great. Um, then I guess that will conclude um, our event today. Thank you again, everyone. And um, we'll, we'll see you um, in the near future. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.